It's a real pleasure and honor to come talk to um, you folks here because this is a story of, of novel drug development. Um, and I started this development uh, prior to coming to the University of Chicago. And although I grew up in Chicago, it's been 22 years since I've been back. So I'm happy to be back at the University of Chicago uh, for just a year now. And, and based on funding from the CRF, we've actually been able to expand the promising results that I'll show you a little bit about here with some um, novel chemistry and uh, uh, molecular engineers at the University of Chicago to sort of amplify this novel therapeutic approach. And so what I'm going to be talking to you about is really bypassing all the, the bad genetic events in a, in a cancer cell and just killing the cancer cell. I don't care what kind of cancer cell it is, and I don't necessarily care about what genetic events gave rise to that cancer. And, and uh, we utilize some of the normal proteins within cells that normally kill cells. For instance, they kill the webbing between your fingers before you're born, so those cells are d disappear, so you have, you have flippers, you have fingers. And so we utilize those same proteins that have gone awry in cancer cells to sort of reprogram those cells to die, okay? And so as you know, overall health depends on a balance of cell death and cell renewal, and there's a rheostat, okay? And this rheostat has gone awry in, in, patient, in, in cancer patients. So if you get unregulated cell survival, cells that are supposed to die don't die, and you get cancer and you get autoimmunity, and if you get cells that um, undergo abnormal cell death, you get things like neurodegeneration, immunodeficiency, and infertility. Okay, we're trying to even this reassess in cancer patients. And the way we do that is I told you that this apoptosis or this cell death is governed by, um, it is a natural occurring phenomenon. And this, this, this group of proteins is called BCL2 proteins. The group isn't important, but there is one very special member of BCL2 proteins that was actually discovered at the University of Chicago by Craig Thompson called BCLXL. So this is a cancer cell. And this family, there are three partners, or there are three members of this family of proteins, right? There's, a, there's members called BACs and BAC. And if you activate these, they kill, they kill cells. They kill cancer cells. The problem is cancer cells upregulate, so they have very, very high levels of these anti-apoptotic proteins, okay? And the one I mentioned was BCLXL. Um, BCL2 and MCL1. The names aren't important, but what these do is they have a stranglehold on backs and back in cancer cells. They do not let go of backs and back, and therefore you get cancer cell survival. So there are stormtroopers within the cell, and these stormtroopers are what I'm interested in. I'm interested in activating the right stormtroopers for the right insult. And so the stormtrooper that I'm interested in is a BH3 only protein, is likely guys. And, and the one I'm interested in is BIM. And, and again, the name is not important. It gets a little confusing. They have crazy names. But, and what's unique about BIM is that BIM is a natural protein. Okay? And so we're going to actually try to use a natural pro the protein to reprogram um, a cancer's ability to evade cell death. And what's unique about BIM is it actually combines the blockers of Bax and Bax, the orange guys down here, and thereby, thereby it releases backs and back, the gray guys, to allow for cells to die. While at the same time, it can actually directly activate those, gr those gray proteins with it, which induce cell, cell death. So it's a very unique, naturally occurring protein. The problem is, there's a therapeutic problem. And this therapeutic problem is really at the forefront of, of cancer research right now. So this is the University of Chicago's favorite anti-apoptotic protein, BCLXL. This is what it looks like when you look at it. Um, magnified in a, in a crystal structure. And there's this thing called a BH3 pocket, okay? And if you, if you, the interaction between, oops, sorry, I want to go back. The interaction between all of these members of this, of this BCL2 family of proteins rely on that hot dog in a bun interaction. So that, that hot dog is what I'm trying to isolate. The problem is, and that's that little purple helix there. That purple helix binds within a cleft within all of those proteins that we, just, that we just talked about. And that purple helix is BIM. The problem is that is only a very, very small part of the actual protein. If you take away the other parts of that protein and you uncover the real death-activating domain, that nice curly cue becomes a floppy piece of spaghetti. And that floppy piece of spaghetti can't go anywhere. It can't get inside cells. It can't be injected IV into patients. Um, and most importantly, it can't bind that cleft. 
So we're using very novel um, cutting edge chemistry to actually take apart, take everything away from that protein except the death, the death activating helix. And we're doing this in concert in the lab that I'm working in and we're also doing it with um, Matt Terrell at the University of Chicago too to expand sort of these promising results. And so our goal is to take the business end of BIM, which is that curly Q, cut it out from the protein, structurally stabilize it, and use it as a therapeutic. Inject it into people, get it into cells, activate that normal cell death, reassat in cancer cells where it was turned off. And, and the group of uh, cancers that we're very interested in is diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And there's lots of reasons why. But um, some of them are here. And most importantly, we want to make changes in patients who, who are refractory to novel chemotherapy. Okay? And there's a large percentage of people with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma who are refractory to therapy. And why is that important? Because diffuse large B-cell lymphoma accounts for the lion's share of all lymphoma cases in, in the United States and worldwide. There are over 30,000 new patients a year with this disease. This disease has sort of abysmal, um, abysmal uh, uh, life expectancy. And you can see that if you divide this disease into three classifications, there's a germinal center B cell like, which is GCB. There's an activated B cell like called ABC, and there's sort of this undefined. And if you look at all of these, prob all of these patients and their probability of survival, you can see that if you are unlucky enough to have the activated B cell type or this undefined type, you only have a 40% chance of survival at 10 years out from, from diagnosis. And it doesn't get much better for the germinal center B-like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which approaches about 60%. And so there's a great clinical need to sort of overcome this apoptotic resistance that we see, the cell death resistance in this, in this uh, group of lymphoma, in, in this group of patients. Right. So what we did was we took that piece of bib we made a structural therapeutic, a novel therapeutic for that. And then we looked at a large panel of human diffuse large B cell lymphoma lines. And again, the names aren't important. This is just sort of what the data looks like. And all those black squiggly dots uh, underneath each one of those lines represent the amount of those anti apoptotics the amount of those orange proteins that are thwarting our ability to kill these cells, right? So each black line means that they've upregulated those orange proteins making chemotherapy ineffective, okay? It turns out that these human diffuse large B cell lymphoma lines are predominantly resistant to the leading class of drug in this family, this BCL2 class of drugs. And they are made by our friends up the street, um, Abbott um, Laboratories, and it's called ABT for Abbott 737. And this is sort of a leading small molecule drug. It's not like the drug that we've made. It's a small molecule drug, which is a very small um, a group of chemical, chemicals brought together um, that's able to target this family of proteins with the same idea, hope, hopefully um, hoping to induce apoptosis or cell death. The problem is, as in the case of HT, you can see there in the red box, that a, a lot of these lymphomas are completely resistant to ABT737. So what we see here, these are cell death curves. The, the, the amount of living cells is shown on the on the axis, on the y-axis there, and increasing amount of drug is shown on the x-axis, okay? At the highest amount of drug that we've used, this, drug, this particular lymphoma line is completely resistant. Well, it turns out that if we use our BIM, it's called bim sob staple peptide, you can see, as shown in red, as you treat these cell lines with increasing amounts of bim sob, you get um, a decrease in viability, and this is in culture. Um, it turns out we've got lots of controls to, to make sure that this is an on-target effect, make sure that that hot dog is actually in the bun. And it turns out it is, and all the other controls are, are, um, don't show any effect. And so based on this work, we actually are bringing this into um, animal models of this disease. And uh, we're joining forces with Matt Terrell at the University of Chicago, um, really solely based on the support from the Cancer Research Foundation to then amplify this and make this even a more strategic uh, therapeutic and that we're going to actually uh, manipulate this fancy chemistry to direct this therapeutic towards the diffuse large B cell lymphoma cells inside patients rather than other cells that, that are not